so, uh, so for me, this event feels uh, a bit nostalgic. Uh, forgive me for saying it. I loved seeing work of the generation. And also, even though, you know, artistic data visualization, uh, the term which emerges around 2004, 2005, right? So, so if according to this term, it's been around for 18 years, but the actual work of uh, creative designers doing more experimental visualization begins around 97, 98. So this field is 25 years old. But of course, one of the big differences, if this panel was 10 years ago, 20 years ago, it probably be all men. <laughs> so that's one big difference is that it's nice to see right more uh, you know, gender and ethnicity diversity. Uh, having said that, again, you know, allow me to be you know, a bit moody sort of in my presentation because I started doing I started my training in art 50 years ago in uh, 1973 as a teenager in Russia, and then I started working in digital art in 1984. And you know, when you are in a particular field for a very long time. You, know, you have this feeling that you've seen this all. Um, but I do want to remind you know, people who are new to this that, as I said, uh, this field of creative data visualization, or what later came to be called data art, begins around 1997, Between 2001 and 2004, already like one third of all the top prices at Transmedia and Art Electronica are going to this kind of work. The critical, the key critical articles about data art and creative data, artistic, what's called, what was, what can be called artistic data visualization, are published around 2005, 2006. And then uh, as the data become more and more available, of all kinds, the field really keeps expanding, 2007, 2008. You know, and then for me, uh, it kind of like this heroic period of data visualization art, we personally, it ends around 2012. So I think, you know, I don't see any new intellectual artistic strategies, you know, which emerged in the last 10 years. And of course, today, you know, you can go to ChatGPT and just ask it to write the code and copy the processing, it'll be done. But we do have, you know, we do see a generation of people, you know, we see people exploring new kinds of data, right? We see people working with some very complex material. So it was very, very exciting to see the work of people today. So let me show you a bit uh, um, what, what I did. So first of all, I just remind again that this is not a new thing. So this is uh, a website which looks right a bit clunky because it's a 20 year old website. Uh, and this is one of the key uh, projects, which I think historically important to this field, which probably not everybody knows in this audience. And we do have over 170 people watching it on YouTube, which is fantastic. Uh, so this is by uh, Martin Wittenberg and uh, Fernando Vegas, History Flow. So exactly 20 years old. I still think it's one of the most interesting and important projects in this field. So we basically uh, took advantage of the fact that Wikipedia has a self-documenting feature, right? You know, with, you can kind of click on a button in Wikipedia and you see the whole history of the text which makes a Wikipedia page and when, when the text was edited by different people. And we decided to visualize history of Wikipedia pages as a history of controversies. And we took you know, pages which today, right, would be very, very also controversial given what's happening in the war in Israel and of course war in Ukraine. So we took pages like Islam, for example. Uh, and, um, and this is what we've done. Uh, that was again, you know, 20 years ago, so the resolution was not as high. And people spend more time doing their projects and less time doing self promotion, which I think was a good idea. Uh, let me say that. Uh, anyway, so what you have here is, uh, uh, is uh, visualizations of particular pages where uh, try to make it bigger, where not even like, where not even like put images left now. Uh, so, uh, when you have is time on the horizontal axis and going left to right, and then we, you know, the height of this um, sort of like sort of shape shows you corresponds to the length of a Wikipedia page at any given time, and then uh, the 
text written by different people is in different colors, right? And we made these creative choices whereby choosing a particular color period, we showed how particular pages represent um, a kind of a battle, right? A confrontation between different voices. Somebody comes, somebody raises something, right? So as opposed to this kind of harmonious and traditional encyclopedic idea of encyclopedia, which you see, you know, when you come to Wikipedia, you just see the whole page. But if you take the page apart, right, you see that it's a cacophony with different voices. And also, again, I'm just showing this project just to remind people that this field has been around for 25 years and people have done amazing work. And, uh, you know, uh, being scientists as well as artists, uh, Fernanda and Martin you know, later also published the paper in the, uh, you know, uh, right, the, the major scientific kind of conference for, uh, for this, uh, oh, sorry, now I can't find it. Anyway, here it is somewhere. Um, Okay, so, but my work, right? So, again, I played, you know, I've been in this field for a long time, and I'm very happy to, that I contributed also my own efforts to development. Uh, I think I published the first article on data visualization as art, that was the data visualization new abstraction into Sublime 2002. Later, I published more articles, such as what is visualization in 2010. So, um, so first, uh, I'm going to show a few projects from uh, the work of a research lab, uh, which we founded when I was a professor at the University of California, San Diego. Exactly this place where all these fires were happening. Um, and, uh, you know, we had a condo, like, right? When I was a professor, we bought a condo near Del Mar. And uh, we saw that last year, because I realized that sooner or later, just going to burn. So I'm very happy I don't owe any property now. <laughs> uh, because, you know, every year this fire would happen. So thanks for reminding us. Um, anyway, um, so the idea was that in 2005, I saw this explosion of cultural data, right? So the, the blogs already existed, but in the summer of 2005, it became possible for people to add images to their blogs. If the social media was just emerging, where Flickr already existed, but it was not a big presence. And I got this idea, which I kind of called cultural analytics, where we can study both contemporary and also historical visual culture, because museums already started digitizing their holdings and the libraries and the archives. And now, of course, thousands of museums have digitized millions of art images, but they didn't really exist in 2005, but I knew it would come, right? So I got this idea that, look, if you can combine techniques of data visualization, which already existed as a field, and you already had amazing projects such as what I showed the history flow. So we can kind of combine this and maybe other methods from digital arts with this big data, we can create something, right? We can create this new methods to study art history, film history, uh, and these methods can be used by professors and students in classes. But also, when I started, I will show you a project in a second, right? When I started doing this project and exhibiting them and showing them in the context of like design, uh, like, you know, like Breda Design Museum in Netherlands or Design Biennale in, um, in Shanghai. And people say, Lev, what are you doing? Is it science? Is it art to design? I said, you know what? It's all of it. I get money from National Science Foundation. I get science grants to run my lab. I fund postdocs. We collaborate with people from a data visualization scientific lab, and then you invite us to show our work in design and art shows, you treat it as art, so it's both. But for me, you know, this was not a formal answer. What I realized as I was doing it, but I was not only interested in this, let's say, scientific methodology, a kind of digital art history, digital humanities, in creating new methods for academics. What I was interested in is creating new imagery new symbolic representations of this information age, right? So, and of course, I was maybe fetishizing the density of data, right? Uh, and this kind of sublime, obvious millions of uh, things, which I'll show in a second. So now I look at them and I think, yeah, this was my artworks and I was hiding, right, in a science lab, you know, and getting money from scientists. But anyway, it's better to work with scientists, which is smart and more organized with art curators anyway, 
So it's a good way to do art, right? Become scientists. Let me, let me show you some of these projects. Some of you know them. Uh, this is like old work 10 years ago. So this is the first project I did with a collaborator who was a PhD student at our university. Uh, and uh, he came to me and he said, Lev, let's visualize Instagram, right? So this was the first project to collect and uh, visualize. Oops, oh my God. Okay, yes, large number of Instagram images. So uh, so we did a few things, right? So, the first, so we did visualizations where the data was organized in one dimension, right? So this is about three days in, uh, let me see what city was it, just a second. I have to check what city was it. Okay, just a moment. Okay, just a second. Okay, we go here. Uh, Tokyo, Tokyo, right? So this is, okay, yeah, here we go. So this is the three days in Tokyo. So we basically collected using Instagram, you know, uh, API, which existed at the time, which Instagram later closed because of security concerns, but, you know, it was not a concern 10 years ago, right? So we collected all Instagram images of a location, which we shared in a five by five kilometer area in the center of Tokyo. And then you know, I wrote a software called um, Image Montage, which we've been distributing as open source since 2011. I mean, now you can, okay, now you can ask ChatGPT to write the software in a second. <laughs> anyway, I wrote this little software. So the software would read the images from a hard drive and we use from, and simply plotted these images in the order in which we shared, right? So basically left to right, top to bottom. And what you see, right, are these kind of wave-like patterns, which can exposed day and night, right? But the night is not completely black because already at the time, People have the ability not only to share images on Instagram, which we took at the second, but also share images on their phone, right? Maybe their vacation, so maybe like some kind of some kind of vulgar, uh, you know, island we want to travel to. So every city had a particular shape of day night. And then, as I said, the reason I think of it as my artworks today, as a data art, is that um, what I liked about it is that there's a kind of randomness here, right? So every you know every part of the spectrum, and if you kind of zoom, if you squint your eyes, and you will see this sine wave pattern, but the sine wave pattern is not perfect because one day people share a bit more, one another day people share, share a bit more a bit early. So what you have is this kind of a uh, you know randomness, and then of course you can zoom in and you can see the individual images and their content, right? So I can I also you know wrote about these images as a kind of like a as a kind of democratic documentary, right? As a documentary made by thousands of people. Uh, and then of course visualization becomes an instrument which gives meaning to these images, but you can also say it imposes meanings, right? Because by organizing these images, yes, yeah, so you can actually zoom in and then you can actually go and download them if you want. So it's like, I think it's about six thousand pixels, right? Um by organizing these images in this particular way, you get the idea that the society as represented right by Instagram sharing is this kind of like semi-ordered, semi-random organism, and every day is a bit different, right? But of course, if you reduce it to like a sine wave, right? If you reduce if you further reduce it to vector visualization, you will get a perfect shape is you collect more data, right? Which is what happens in statistics. So we didn't want to do a server reduction, right? We wanted to stay at this level of images and create what I, what I described uh, using the term media visualizations, visualizations which don't show you the data, visualization which shows you the media. So just show you some few examples um, from this project. Um, so this, this and, then, and then we did like another layout. So this was another version of image plot, which I published where uh, one axis uh, uh, controls how far the image is from the center, and another axis controls uh, the, uh, another, sorry, another, axis another axis corresponds to the angle. So in this case, for example, the, the date and time the image was shared, uh, you know, corresponds to the image position, right? So you can go from left to right. So this is seven days. Now you understand, right, why it looks like this kind of fruit or the slices. And then I was trying to figure out what to use, you know, for the uh, distance to the center. And I think I just, I basically use basic computer vision, right? So we measure the saturation. 
again using little code which we wrote, um, and uh, you get average saturation of each image, right? So again, what what I like, what I what I think is beautiful about it, every day is a bit different, right? Some days people share more, some people they share less. In this is seven days, actually, it's interesting to show today. It's seven days in Tel Aviv, using um, you know uh, on the part, very important day, which is Day of National Remembers Remembrance, which is like the biggest. I don't want to call it holiday. It's Memorial Day in Israel. And this is the data we collected in 2013. And I'll just show you a bit more. Uh, and uh, so, for example, here you can compare, like, this is San Francisco, right? Uh, you get one signature. Oh, sorry. Maybe. And then this is like, this is Tokyo, this is Bangkok. Uh, and we also published articles about it. Anyway, so this is one project. So maybe what I'll do is just show uh, show now one. Uh, so overall, we did about forty five projects. Uh, most of them we did in the first two years. Just me and the postdoc. I was the only person with, with kind of de with a design art background. Um, so you know, we hired PhD students to help us write the code. I had a postdoc, I would hire my own PhD students because working with big data, it's a bit difficult to do it yourself. Now it's a bit easier, but most of like 1500 visualizations from our lab, you can find in Flickr, most of them I did myself because I was the one with, with an art background. And maybe I'll just show briefly, uh, maybe I'll show briefly, 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 I will show what I want to show. I want to show this one. Ah, yes, I want to show, uh, just a moment, what is, well, it's not here. Sorry, just a second. Ah, oh, yeah. Um, so this one is, a, yeah, so all visualizations are kind of similar, right? The software reads images from a hard drive, it produces them to a small size, and then using every existing metadata or the um, image features, which are measured using basic computer visual software, uh, you can write the code yourself on Python, but I can wrote it using different software. Uh, you know, the images are positioned in a space. So this is uh, maybe biggest visualization which we did, and it's amazing because it was 2010. So my code was, which was not optimized, was running on the basic iMac, and it took like two days to render it. So it's one million manga pages, right? So we basically found this website which had uh, manga, which people, manga fans will be translating, right, into other languages. Um, and they downloaded all of it. So that was like a global manga. Uh, and uh, it turns out it was over 1 million pages corresponding to uh, around 800 you know, manga series. And as you know, manga is one of the most popular, right, forms of culture. And uh, in this visualization, again, here it is, uh, uh, the whole uh, so basically, I made it black and white, so I can render it, right, at a larger size, because the software I was using, the largest size I can render would be 2 gigabytes. So this was 20,000 by 20,000 pixels, and uh, we can, and you know, all of it, we make it available on Flickr. We don't sell anything. Uh, we are kind of open source. Uh, this is what I was advised. <laughs> uh, so you can download all of it, so we can go here. And here is, I think, on, I think on Flickr, you know, just to make it reasonable, the largest image is 10K, so you can download it. And so here, for example, you can go, you can get the 6,000 by yeah, 6,044. It will probably take a while to load, but the images are organized. Yeah, so here it is. It will take a while to load, but it will load eventually. And the images are organized. We just go here so we can talk about it. Yeah, the images are organized by... Uh, uh, standard deviation on the x-axis, but it's not interesting. But what's more interesting is they organize by entropy on the y-axis. And uh, here, I think, excuse me, here I think I have close-ups, so you can see what's kind of going on. So this is this, so this is the example of a high entropy area. So high entropy means it's hard to predict what the next pixel will be. So this is a manga which is very dense, more work goes into it. Even this is a different part of this cloud, right? So this, this was the top part, and this is the bottom part where the entropy is low, so this the style is more postal-like, et cetera, et cetera. 
And maybe I can just take literally one second and just to show you what I'm doing now, uh, because I'm looking for advice from everybody. Uh, so after doing this work for 15 years, I published a book called Cultural Analytics of Native Press in 2020, when I felt, okay, I have enough. I have enough of data, sorry, sorry to say this in this, in this context. You know, just after 15 years, I felt I said I need to do something else. And last year, I realized I want to I want to make single images again, which was amazing because 10 years ago, if somebody said, Lev, one day you'll be making single images, I said, no, no way. I only want to work with millions of images, but this is how human mind works. And uh, you can sort of visit now my, so I have a new website specifically for my new art starting from last year, although you can also find my drawings going back 45 years. So, so some people were surprised to find out that I'm a professionally classically trained artist, etc., uh, etc. Et so this is where I come from. And you can find these images. And this is, of course, both artistic and also partly, let's say, theoretical explorations into the possibilities of AI. All these images are done with mid-journey. Even I usually edit them using the Lightroom. And I have my special kind of tricks to... Uh, to make images which don't look like a typical AI. Uh, like I don't have time to comment upon them, just to show you a few things. Uh, you have, for example, things like this. So here my trick is to give it a prompt. So uh, to ask it to make architectural sets or theater sets. So maybe it looks like some animation. <coughs> Sorry, from 1940s or 1950s, right? So the idea is to reduce realism on purpose so then, you know, images will not be outdated like a month from now when the journey new version comes out. Yeah, of course, it's also nostalgic. You have this kind of Soviet communist kind of figures, this uh, frozen world. It's also my emotional reaction uh, against the war last year because many of us felt you know, terrified and frozen at what happened. Uh, um, so now I'm preparing two personal exhibitions which will open in a, in a few weeks in Portugal, and then in two months in Seoul, and over and I will each exhibition will show about thirty five images as prints. So now I'm like into prints, um, and I just show you again a few things. So um, so I'm doing all those things right, and they're beautiful, and people want to show them, and I will just I will finish in thirty seconds. But basically, I ultimately feel that this is not quite it, right? Because fifteen years ago. I made this experiment, right, and created this lab where we try to where we try to uh, figure out new ways to deal with multiplicity of images and the fact that they have this image explosion, and we develop these techniques, which at least in some ways allowed us to visualize thousands or even millions of images, right? And now, you know, now I'm working with uh, AI, and yeah, I can make 400 images in one evening, and like everybody else, I made 60,000 images in 50 months, but I know that I'm only exploring a tiny, tiny, tiny portion of this huge latent space, right, which neural network work. So somehow there should be a way to do different kind of art using these latent networks, uh, not make images one at a time, but to do something else. So what I'm hoping, I don't know how, is I'll be able to maybe my previous work, right, in visualizing large image collections, which was the response to explosion, uh, to a quantitative explosion of image culture in around 2005, 2008, but now we have a new explosion because in the last uh, year, people created more images of AI than all the images in the history of photography. So while I'm really enjoying making single images, I also feel that maybe this is not ultimately you know, what I should be doing with media, and uh, I'm not sure what will come next. Thank you so much for the time.